But now I'm thrilled to introduce my first guest to enlighten us on what the music is up to in our floors of love. She's a professor of music and piano at Reading University, a soloist in her own right, a much sought after teacher and accompanist, a violinist, and best of all, she has been my friend and my accompanist for many years. She is Elizabeth Dockrell Tyler. Elizabeth, welcome to The Sound Bath and I'm so excited about this song. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say about it. Well, how did you experience it? Hello there. Yes, well, I listened to it a few times when I heard that you were quite excited about it. And the more you listen to it, the more you hear. Exactly. At first you think, this is quite a sort of little innocuous, quite simple ditty. Mm. And it's, of course, it's much more complex than that. Uh, thus its success as, an, as a piece of art, I yes. think. Yes, because um, that is what it is. Yes. It is a piece of art. This. So you rightly spotted that. And I suppose I heard that on the second hearing. Um, I think that's quite normal. I think that's what's been happening for people. Yes. Yes, I confess to that because... Yes. You're not immediately blown away always by things that you're exposed to musically. Sometimes right. it takes a while just for something to sink in. Yeah. Although I had a different experience. <laughs> <laughs> I was blown away. But, you, but then I was there. So you were in the live experience. Right. And yes. I think perhaps that would have you know, made your experience feel different yeah, to absolutely. mine. Absolutely. Um, but having looked at it, I would say you'd opened up a can of worms. I'm delighted. <laughs> so, I mean, just looking at it from the angles that I can look at it from, right. uh, which are, as a musician, mm -hmm. looking at, at it as a piece of music and how is it put together. So, structurally, I was very intrigued and interested once I'd heard it a right. few times. And so I went to the piano to try and work out what key it was in. Now, that was my first problem, and I thought, <laughs> the hell is this? It's actually in a pe pentatonic, right. minor pentatonic, on right. E flat, which would be uh, commonly used for all sorts of music in the world. Mm -hmm. It has a slightly Eastern flavour, it's a very accessible sort of uh, scale, and of course it's used in the blues scale. It's right. used in blues, in rock and roll, and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So... So as a scale, we hear quite a lot of it, but in a jazzy, bluesy disguise, as it were. Right. Now what he's doing here is he's producing a much more traditional piece of work. Now I think that's what took me by surprise, mm -hmm. um, because when I first listened to the first line of it, I thought, oh yeah, there's a lone guitar. And then I thought, right, well, we're, it's going to come up with the beat. We're going to hear him coming in full blast. Right. We didn't. No. So divergence from the expected tradition, the guitar sets out a bit of the material for four bars, it's written in 4-4, four, four. and the guitar sets out four bars in this key of E flat minor with these little slides, if you remember, Yes. within a perfect fifth. So you've got these little slides, which seem to be a characteristic of the work that Adam produces, that's mm -hmm. what you often hear this kind of sliding fifth then his voice enters below the guitar right again that's a, quite unusual so we've only got really a single line on top of a single line mm -hmm. and the guitar is on top of him and he's underneath right. so i think that sets out the emotional content of what it's going to be it's quite sad mm -hmm. isn't it would you say I would, yes. I was bawling when I heard it the first time. <laughs> because you have, at the end of his first four-bar phrase, you you have the words closer, mm -hmm. in a sort of a sighing or a crying, falling minor third, mm -hmm. which echoes the rising, or the almost inversion of the rising fifth that you had from the guitar. Right. So he has these falling phrasing all the time using this minor third and then repeats this phrase in that low part of his voice which is quite a almost like a private area of his voice yes it feels very intimate it does almost like we're not really meant to be into it yet we're yes. not really meant to hear it right it's not really for us it's more for him yes and then the guitar continues with that 
what you might call almost like in ancient music it would have been called perhaps a ground bass mm -hmm. or an ostinato but it's something that just repeats itself so the guitar funnily enough is very very simple it's not indulging itself just single notes mostly crotchets the odd sort of dotted note right on um on top of the vocal line repeating itself so not producing any excitement no because the excitement is in the voice <laughs> <laughs> i thought you might say that mm -hmm. <laughs> so then having had eight bars so four bars repeated of that ending with closer closer if you remember mm -hmm. then we have what you might call a b section for only four bars Right. You would have expected it for eight, but it's only four bars, almost like an exhortation. Right. And if you remember the words from that, it starts with hey. Yes. It's to do with what we all feel. Mm -hmm. We all feel the rain. We all feel the same. We right. all feel the rain. Yes. We can't change. That is almost like it's inserted into the music format. You'd expect it to be a longer section of music. It's like another idea that has come in. In a way, it's part of the first section, and in another way, it's not. Right. So that's why I called that the B section when I was listening. Another interesting thing about it is that he's brought up his vocal pitch range mm -hmm. from the very low up about a minor third. Now here we're talking about minor third again. Yes. So he's brought it up a minor third from the B flat as he started the first section with to the D flat and then he goes underground again right. at the end of that phrase and then he's ready for the chorus which I think is the, possibly the thrilling bit the, the chorus has come up yet another minor third right. so he's tearing his pitch scape as right. it were so now we're talking about perhaps a little bit more out in the open a little bit more coming out as it right. were. And speaking. And speaking more plainly. At the same time, he becomes more metrical. You can really hear the beat on that section, mm -hmm. on that chorus. So we could all sing along with that, probably. In the second section of the song, in the chorus part, although there's the same pentatonic, the E-flat minor pentatonic being used, Adam also adds in here the notes F and C-flat. And if we look at this closely, we can see that when you incorporate these two extra notes, you're coming into what we call the natural minor of E flat. So, in fact, he crosses from pentatonic into the natural minor and back again. So, strictly speaking, he is actually using two scales for this song. And the guitar, for the first time in the backing, mm -hmm. starts to pick the little quavers. So it goes plonk, 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 plonk. Right. You can hear a little bit of movement in the guitar. And there's um, the odd strum on an E-flat minor chord. Right. But I would say, on the whole, this song feels largely unaccompanied. Okay. It's in a ballad style. We're harking back to something much older. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at that as being perhaps a more primitive accompaniment that is exposing the emotions and the desolation right. of the text. It's actually connecting with that part of all of us, that mm. primitive part of all of us. And I think that's what's amazing about this song. I just want to go back to what you were saying about the B section, what you regard as the B section. And I kind yes. of, I agree with you. I think there are three distinct different sections yes. in this song from a singer's point of view. And I've yes. spoken about it a little bit already. But what I wanted to ask you is this. You know, at the end of what you were talking about as the B section, yes. where the, the notes kind of disappear and then you can hear the count. So it, it disappears and it goes three, four, and then yes. the chorus comes in. Yes. And it comes in on a different tonal scape again. Yes, that's Is that why right. it's thrilling? Is that the why it makes you go, yeah. <gasps> And all the hair stand up on your arms. Yes, I think Adam's particularly good at doing this, where he will abandon a certain sort of pitch range right. and then hit a big note that seems to be almost unrelated. And you think, gosh, he must have had to have had that in his ears before he hit it. Yes, in his and body, yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> of course, he's, he is within the same key. He, he's right. still in E flat minor. Uh, the, that B section 
which goes way underground just at the end. It, he embellishes the end of it, as you, yeah. as you remember, with a pentatonic scale, right. ending on a low E flat. Now, as I said already, that four bar section is almost inserted for a different way to what you would have expected. You expect it, perhaps he'll go on. You might expect even a repeat of those four bars or something. Right. But instead it's left trailing down, you know, in these sort of deep pitches. Yes. And then there's a two bars of rest to make up the bar, to make up the, right. that four bar section. Yes. Where you think what's coming next the next thing is he's going to hit a g flat which is exactly a minor i think a minor tenth right above that exactly. for the chorus yeah. and that's what produces the thrill in the listener that right. you're experiencing yes because it is very that um, is thrilling high notes of course are thrilling aren't they yeah well they're the money notes aren't they <laughs> <laughs> they're the emotional potentially hysterical ways of pushing emotion through an audience aren't they yes on a structural level when he's ended on the e-flat he's going again to the g-flat you know he's playing with the g-flat and the e-flat and right. as i said he's playing with that as, as a sort of a drooping sighing crying type of relationship right. but here what he's done is he's moved up a whole tenth right into the g-flat above in the next vocal section yes i suppose yeah. the next vocal area so that is what i think that's a touch of genius there yes. to do that i think so too <laughs> I because love it. he could have moved up perhaps two you know two steps onto the g flat immediately above yeah, but it wouldn't have the same effect no so he's brought the whole thing up in the pitch and he's sitting up there on the g flat which for him it's quite, it's quite a high note i believe it is a very high note, but but it feels very comfortable for him. And I think it's something that I've heard him, you know, do again and again and again. It's not out of his comfort zone at yeah. all. Because this is the other thing, of course, um, and I talked about it before, is that mm. the song sits absolutely in his voice, in, his, in the sweet spot of his voice. Yes. And on this chorus, uh, you've got, the, you know, as you had with the other, the first section, mm -hmm. you've got that repeated, almost lulling type of feeling to it and again the same and then the third time he goes up and climbs right up onto i think probably it's a c flat or you might call it a b natural if you want which is the high point of the piece this is the probably the highest note he gets it, it you know apart from when he's improvising right so it's about to peak and again that is a climb uh, on that section it's a climb da, 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 da. so he's climbing up to it rather than just hitting it so the chorus is very interesting for that reason because there is a real if you were sort of carving out a shape with a pencil it, you would see that it's sort of pyramid shaped melodically in the a section if you were to draw a graph on each phrase you would see that the line moves downwards. All of the phrases are downward moving, which creates a melancholic effect. Mm. And in the B section also, everything is downward moving. There's no upward driving um, phrases, which is quite unusual for Adam. Then in C, we have a lot of downward moving um, mel melodic lines, apart from just in the middle, where you get a rise towards the peak of the song before again there is another descent. Another thing I, that struck me was the fact that there's no accompaniment really, which I find astonishing because it means something wonderful for singers. <laughs> it means that the note live in Adam's body. Yes, I think the accompaniment that's set out in the first four bars is then repeated on top of the vocal mm -hmm. for the next ensuing eight bars. Mm -hmm. And I think thereafter as well. So it's being treated a bit like another voice. Right. Or a bit like a like an ancient instrument. Certainly not like a guitar. Mm -hmm. Because if it was being treated like a modern guitar, you would hear a lot of harmonic strummed chords underneath. Right. And certainly for the first part, the first half of this song, we're not really hearing that. 
and in fact we're only hearing almost a very classical picked sound mm -hmm. in the C section, in the chorus section. So the guitarist really never lets rip. So all the onus does rest on Adam to create that intervallic uh, relationship with the guitar. And sometimes the guitar is inverted mm -hmm. compared to what the voice is doing. The pitching is very good mm -hmm. and obviously Adam is listening to what the guitar is doing. So as the guitar is sort of sweeping upwards, he's sweeping downwards mm -hmm. and so on. They're, some of the time they're meeting in the middle. But it is a very ancient type of layout for the accompaniment. So what I noticed about the guitar part was that it's it sounds like single notes, which is unusual for a guitar, it's a slight classical sort of feeling or an early feeling to it, mm -hmm. because it's much more easy for a guitarist to strum a chord here and there than it is to produce that single line. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting. But the other thing I noticed about it was that the, the little recurring four bar phrase underneath the voice in, in the first A section was not really written for the guitar in the pentatonic. It's the voice that is pentatonic and the guitar is really using the, the standard tonality from E flat minor. Yeah, so the guitar is using or juxtaposing the minor seconds of G flat with an F just back and forth quite a lot of the time, apart from slide, which I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But there's no part in the vocal line where that is the same. Most of the intervallic structure is confined absolutely to pentatonic scale, so we're talking about tones or minor thirds in the vocal range. Mm -hmm. And especially in the embellished part, you can hear all of that mm -hmm. as well. Another interesting thing about the vocal structure is that um, I said before that you would use the um, minor pentatonic if you were creating a blues effect. This is distinctly not a blues piece. No. In any shape or form. Okay, the subject matter is a little bit doleful mm -hmm. in some respects. That's as far as it gets into the blues. But musically, this is not blues because there are no real broken notes. There's no, uh, no squash notes. Uh, so he's not using the, the blues tradition at all. No. What is he using instead? So he's using the notes from the E flat minor pentatonic scale. I don't oh. know if he knows he's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what he's doing. Yeah. So we get, um, of course, there is an intersection between um, blues and this ballad type style. Quite a lot of times when he produces a falling fourth, so ba ba ba, with um, using sort of minor third at the bottom, and that if you produce B flat, D flat, and E flat, for instance, in this key, you would get that. So we get quite a lot of that feeling on the ends of the phrases, mm -hmm. which is, I think, very instinctive to Adam. Okay, so you you were saying that the accompaniment is sort of the counter melody, but what I'm interested in is the fact that. I think this is why people think it's a simple song. Yes. There seems to be no harmonies. No. And and there isn't. It's sort of very chordally sparse, one could say. Right. Um, and I think that's all deliberate. Mm -hmm. And as I've said, if you were putting one chord underneath it, and occasionally the guitarist does do that, it would be an E flat minor chord. So mm. E flat, G flat and B flat. Right. Um, but you could invert that, you could put it in any, and I think he does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's basically, in the olden days, would have been called a drone. You know, when you've got very limited harmony and you're oh. just inserting it in as per, like, bagpipes of yore. But right. I'm not saying that the guitar sounds <laughs> like a bagpipe. <laughs> <laughs> but then we're talking about the harmonic interest. When you look at the melodic line, and you look at it just as a whole, and you look at the three sections of the song, and you look at the melodic or the harmonic centre behind each section, you'll find section A, you've got the B flat. Everything's mm -hmm. moving around that. Right. Section B, you're rising, as I said before, it mm -hmm. rises as it goes. Mm -hmm. So you've got the D flat section, 
and then section C you've got the G flat section. Now if we're looking at that, that those three notes do construct a chord and that chord if you were to put it down and leave it down on an old organ or something that would be the perfect backing for the whole of the song. Genius. That's kind um, of genius though, right? It is. It is. It, it may be innate. It might have been something that he did inadvertently. That's what I'm trying to say. Another interesting thing is if you took the G flat, the E flat, or I said D flat, but if you, if you made it an E flat and you took the lower note B flat, mm -hmm. there you have got the E flat minor chord itself. Right. In its second inversion for all you musos out there. So that's the chord in its second inversion, just sit, sitting there. I think to some extent that has been done instinctively. Mm. And is that why Monty is picking it up on the guitar? I think, he, yes, I think he's, he's quite aware of what he's, what he's doing. He's also aware that you can't shove loads of chords in under a pentatonic vocal line. It no. would just sound stupid. Yes, it won't work. In right. fact, it would sound like you had mixed two worlds. You were bringing two palettes together that are musically not very compatible. Right. And I think Monty has instinctively felt that, and that's why he has pared it down, is not trying to be clever. Yes. Yet. And in fact, he is being very clever. He's being very clever in this song. So the, the very bareness and the the ballad feeling to the whole the whole way the song is put together made me think that in the past we have a huge ballad tradition. Mm -hmm. We had the broadside ballads, for instance, um, from the 16th century up to the 19th century, which were a main way that people sort of took their news and talked about things that were of interest to them or that moved them emotionally. So we have a long, long tradition in history of the ballad. Mm -hmm. And there used to be, throughout Europe, there would be minstrels who would walk through different parts of the country, get paid to do it, who would learn a song, sing it, people would pick it up by ear, and then various other people would distribute broadside ballads so these are printed just the words no music at all obviously right. people didn't go around reading music yes they would look at the words try to remember what they'd heard right. last week yes the tune <laughs> <laughs> we're not unlike that nowadays are we that's what we try to well, do I mean, I mean it's a bit like old-fashioned karaoke yeah but i yeah. mean a lot of singers actually mm. this is how they learn music yeah they so, actually learn music this way by listening yes. to other singers. But imagine the frustration if you had just the words oh. in your house, in your hand, and you think, these are beautiful words, but I don't know how it goes. Yes. Now, I got a feeling that this very ancient ballad tradition had affected Adam somehow as it's mm. come down uh, through history. And that the words in themselves read as a story that's important. There is an also a little message in the, in the middle for everybody to try to understand what two characters would be like if they were outlawed in their society. Very akin to what you would have got in the broadside ballads. An right. attempt to, to plead with people to try to understand and open their minds to either an individual story or a situation mm -hmm. and I got very much that feeling from this song that it resembles a broadside ballad mm -hmm. perhaps not as long as they used to be where your minstrel would at some point have given you the music and you would have put those words that you already had in your hand to that music and of course in those days the minstrels very much would have been a cappella singers Yes. Meaning without accompaniment. Yes. In, in a kind of similar way to what Adam is doing with the yes. song. Yes. Because it's very much a cappella, really. He could sing this quite easily without any accompaniment. I think so. He could have the sheet of words in front of him, or in his mind in his mm -hmm. case, and produce a pentatonic elaboration on his text. On the right. text in front of him, he could improvise upon it, which is what he does some of the time in this. But of course, he's 
he has actually structured it. He structured the song. Yes, and we are so used to him doing that anyway. He takes mm. a song, he kind of gives us a blueprint for a song usually, mm. and then he goes off and in different situations in different concerts he comes up with a completely different way of singing the song i mean it still adheres very much to the tune and the, the lyrics but he cha mm. he changes it up to sound completely different mm. and so i'm excited to hear how he's going to change up this song when he sings it next <laughs> yes i would think he will probably it, it lends itself to all sorts of things as as Good works of art always do, you know, right. you can do all sorts of things with them, they're very pliable. Yes. The other thing that occurred to me was that when, when I saw that title, Outlaws of Love, well, immediately I thought outlaws and I thought of people like Robin Hood and so on, you know, the bad, <laughs> the bad boys, perhaps yes. of the folk tradition, or who've come through the story, through the centuries, right. um, who had ballads written about them. Or love stories, which very often didn't end very well, and mm. everything boded ill. <laughs> <laughs> if if you tried very hard, you might just avert a tragic ending. Right. In some of these old broad to sheet ballads, and you get that feeling here that he is trying to avert a tragic ending. He is trying to say that the love that two people may feel for each other has to be fought for it has to be tolerated it has to be one has to appeal to other people around in order to get a fair judgment and fair treatment yes and to be accepted and to be accepted yes. i think because of the way it harks back into the past directly it represents a divergence mm -hmm. from adam's usual stuff and whether or not he is aware of that it represents a hook right into the past yes and yet it is still a very modern song because it it is uh, looking at the meter generally it's a four four it's mm -hmm. four beats in a bar even though the b section it sounds like it's very free form mm -hmm. on first listening but it's not really the whole thing fits into qu a quite strict four four if you wished it to be and so you could drive it in, in some other harmonic direction right. if you wanted to it's not like it has lopsided timings in it or anything like that so it is written in quite a structured way here's me assuming it was written I, I don't know if it was actually written or whether it was done by ear I don't know if you know that I don't actually I know that there were other musicians who worked with him so I'm assuming that they wrote it down but I don't know if it was just a jamming session because sometimes musicians work that way too yes and a lot of good songs I think in history have been produced by this almost sort of lucky clashing of, of elements that yes. come together and produce opportunistically yes. something that you didn't know you weren't conscious of at the time right and that might be very much a way that I can imagine Adam working. Thank you, Elizabeth.